What is it that really makes God happy? I ask that because I think we get that mixed up sometimes. Sometimes I think, at least from the way that we act, that what we think that what God really is looking for, what really makes God happy, is then when we get church right. When we do things in the right way and we follow the the commands and we, we just do church right. It's what Israel thought in the Old Testament. Their focus was on right rites, right rituals. And they thought that as long as they were doing the feasts and the fast and all of that, that God was pleased with that. But then the prophets are constantly speaking to disabuse them of that notion. So in Micah 6, uh, God sort of calls Israel to task through the prophet in setting up what, is, what amounts to a trial where they were being charged with an offense before God. The jury is the mountain, so they're called to, to before the mountains. God is the prosecuting attorney, and Israel is the accused. And Israel has, or Judah, has nothing to stand on, and so they seek a plea deal. So in Micah chapter 6, verse 6, what can I bring to the Lord? Should I, now notice the progression here, should, I, should we bring burnt offerings? Should we bow down before the God Most High with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams or 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? Notice the intensification of different rituals. Maybe a burnt offering of a yearling ram, or maybe that's not enough. Maybe a thousand rams, or 10,000 rivers of oil, or even human sacrifice. We'll offer our own children to pay for our sins. And God says, and that's the one, I'll take care of that. I'll offer my firstborn son for your sins. But that's not what I want. What I want is this, he continues, verse uh, 8. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what the Lord requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. If you really want to know what God wants, it's not simply ritual that reflects our hearts to God, but it's our actions that we love the things that God loves so that we seek to do what is right, we show mercy to other people, and we walk in humility before our God. And then in the next chapter, Micah tells us what really gives God his his greatest pleasure. Uh, Micah 7, verse 18. Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in mercy. What makes God happy is we can extend mercy to his people. In fact, the message translation puts it like this. You don't nurse your anger and don't stay angry long, for mercy is your specialty. That's what you love most. What really gives God delight is when his people repent and come back to him to walk humbly before him, and then he can forgive their sins and shows mercy. Nothing gives God more pleasure than to forgive. We continue this morning with our look at the Gospel of Luke that we're calling Christ for All. We're looking at different themes that Luke seems to stress a little bit more than the other Gospel writers that sort of uh, gives us the, the idea that what he's really stressing in his book is to stress that Christ is Savior of the whole world. He is Christ for all. And the kind of themes we've been looking at is Luke's interest on women as disciples of Jesus and children and the poor. Last week it was the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to notice Luke's emphasis on repentance. The noun repentance occurs 22 times in the Greek New Testament. 11 are found in Luke's writings. The noun, uh, the verb rather, repent, occurs 32 times. 14 are from Luke's pen. So Luke is stressing this idea of repent, of repentance. In fact, we almost saw an example of that last week. We're talking about John the Baptist and the people coming to him to be baptized. And, and then we said, we got more to say about that. Well, you know, he, he, they come and they, and they want to be baptized, but baptism, as important as it is, is another ritual. And John responds to them coming like this. John said to the crowds coming to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers. Not a good way to warm your crowd up. Uh, Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. 
You see, baptism doesn't do any good if it doesn't represent a heart that has humbled itself before God, a heart that has repented. So produce fruits that, sh that uh, show that you have repented. And John, uh, the, the text continues, what shall we do? The crowd wants to know, what is that fruit going to be? And John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with one who has none, and anybody that has food do the same. You see, the fruit of repentance shows that we care about the things that God cares about so that we're going to be sharing. Now, that makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Because, hey, we've got two shirts and we've got food. So that means our showing repentance is going to mean that we're going to treat other people the way that God does in being concerned for them. Well, then he kind of redirects to some of the specific groups that are there. The tax collectors want to know, what should we do? And he says, don't collect any more than you're required to. Tax collectors got rich because they collected more taxes than was really required, and they kept the difference. And he says, well, if you want to repent, yeah, stop doing that. Just re re uh, collect what you're required to by the law. Now, if there's a group that's more hated than the tax collectors in the first century culture among the Jews, it was Roman soldiers, right? Some soldiers asked him, well, what should we do then? He replied, don't extort money. Don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Don't abuse your power in order to line your pockets or to bully other people. Be content with what you've been called to be. So repentance starts to look like being sincerely sorry for what we've done wrong and then changing our behavior to match that. And then what we might call Jesus' mission statement. When... Um, uh, Matthew is called as an apostle. He throws a big feast, invites Jesus and all of his tax collector buddies. And the Pharisees are confused by that because, you see, they think uh, sin is like cooties. You catch it by hanging around people that's got it. And so you kind of separate yourself from sinners. And so they are uh, critical of Jesus because he's hanging out with sinners. And the response of Christ is this, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's Matthew and Mark's version. Luke says the, almost the same thing word for word, except he adds two words. Here's Luke's version of that same text. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus didn't come to call sinners just to hobnob with them and, and share a meal with them. He came to spend time and develop relationships because it was his task, his mission statement, to call sinners to repent. That's the emphasis that Luke gives here. And then in Luke chapter 10, Jesus compares the cities that he's ministering to to some of the cities in the Old Testament. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Now, Tyre and Sidon are not exactly uh, paragons of morality in the Old Testament. These are the pagan capital of Phoenicia. It's the hometown of Queen Jezebel, for crying out loud. But his point is, if I would have preached these things, and if I would have performed these things, in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. But you're not repenting. So in the day of judgment, they're going to have a better spot than you do. And then he says basically the same thing about Nineveh in the next chapter. He says the men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment in this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. Remember the Jonah story. Jonah was very reluctant to preach to Nineveh because he knew they may repent, and if they do, God will forgive them. And he doesn't want Nineveh to be. So he tries to run away from God in the big fish story. Um, and then he gets there, and his sermon in Nineveh goes like this. Forty days, Nineveh will be destroyed. That's it. He leaves. And Nineveh repents. And God forgives. And Nineveh is going to judge this generation, Jesus says. They repented at the preaching of Jonah. And you're hearing something more dramatic than Jonah and you're not repenting. And then in Luke 13, Jesus is asked about a current event that had just happened. It was in all the papers, if they'd have had papers, where, where Pilate 
kills a bunch of Galileans and mixes their blood with their sacrifices. Don't know anything about that other than it happened and they asked Jesus about it. And uh, Jesus answers them, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? You see, karma is not a Christian doctrine. Karma, the idea that you get what you give, that all that goes around comes around, that you suffer from your own mis... See, the, the principle that's behind the New Testament is grace, not karma. God wants to give us what we don't deserve, better than we deserve. So we like kind of the idea of karma. We can sort of convince ourselves that people that suffer, suffer because they deserve it. And therefore, if I keep on my P's and Q's and do what's right, I won't have to suffer like that. Jesus says, that's not the point. Here's the point for you guys. I tell you, no, unless you repent, you too will perish. In case we don't get that, he repeats the same thing word for word in verse 5. Unless you repent, you shall too likewise perish. That all of us are called to repent. On my first trip to Ukraine, we were passing out these uh, invitations to our meetings uh, on the street. And I uh, uh, had a translator following us around in case we got into conversation. And one lady was completely confused, in fact, outraged a little bit, because on our invitation, it, uh, it said, come here how God forgives sinners. And she was outraged. Why would God want to forgive sinners? Now, this was an awkward conversation because it took us a while to figure out why it was that she was so upset. Why would God want to forgive sinners? You see, in her mind, sinners are like axe murderers and rapists and, and capitalists, you know, those kinds of things. And why would he forgive people like that? He should be loving people like me or just regular people. Jesus says, no, you're all sinners and you all need to repent the thing that you need to, to lose is this idea that you're better than other folks. Every sinner needs to repent, and every one of us is a sinner. Again, that emphasis in Luke on repentance. And then we come to Luke 15, where he really ratchets up the, uh, the uh, lesson of repentance. As Jesus tells a series of parables that are pretty much set up by the same thing we saw earlier. Je Jesus is um, unbelievable to the Pharisees and, and teachers of the law because he's hanging around with sinners and eats with them. And so Jesus re reacts to their reaction by telling a series of three stories. The first one is of a shepherd who's lost a sheep. And Jesus says he'll leave the 90 and 9 there's all of his other sheep in the sheep pen. He'll go out and find that sheep. And when he finds it, he'll bring it back and he'll throw a party for his friends who are shepherds because that which is lost is now found. And he makes this point. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. What is it that God delights in? It's when sinners repent than over the 99 persons who do not need to repent. Now, that's a hypothetical. Jesus is not saying there are 99 people that don't need to repent. The rejoicing that takes place in heaven is when sinners repent. Well, then he tells another story. Uh, this story is of a woman that loses a coin, probably referring to one of the gold coins that was her dowry, which is her protection for the future in case something happens to her husband. She can't find it, so she tears her house apart looking for it. She finally finds it, and when she does, she has her neighbors over and throws a party as they rejoice together because what was lost is now found. And Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. The emphasis here on repentance. But then there's one more story, the one we're the more familiar with. The story, the parable of the lost boy which we know of as the prodigal son. It's the story of a, a boy that's not satisfied with his life. He wants his inheritance now so he can go and live on his own. So he goes to his father and says, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my inheritance now. And the father does. You see, this is a story. Don't think that's going to happen in, in real life. I mean, I tried it a couple of times, but it didn't happen in real life. And, and, and so... 
the young man goes off and lives how he wants to, which is wild living, and he wastes all of his inheritance. That's what prodigal means, wasteful. And so when his money disappears, all of his friends disappears, the parties disappear, and he finds himself in a pig pen because that's where he can eat the slop that's meant for the pigs because he has nothing. And then Jesus tells this interesting process of repentance that the prodigal goes, for, goes through. First, he realizes he comes to his senses. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. So he comes to the realization in the, that this is bad, that I've brought this on myself, that even servants back in my father's house has plenty to eat, and here I'm eating what the pigs eat. He comes to a realization. Sometimes people have to hit rock bottom before the results, the the. the the depth of their sin becomes real to them. And sometimes those that love them give them a great disservice by rushing in to cushion the consequences of their sin and make it easier for them to continue to live in their sin. When people are struggling with addiction, we talk about some people being uh, codependent. They're enablers. They take away the consequences of the bad choices so the people never come to rock bottom. And because they never hit rock bottom, they never come to the realization here that change needs to take place. The prodigal son did. And then he feels remorse. He makes up this speech that he's going to give to his father when he goes back. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He feels remorse for that. He feels bad about his sin. Now understand feeling bad about sin, feeling remorse, even deep remorse, is not the same thing as repentance. But Paul talks about a godly sorrow that works repentance, a godly sorrow that leads to repentance. That once we come to this remorse, if it's true and if it's deep enough and if we take responsibility, then it's going to motivate us to repentance. And that's what the prodigal son comes to, which leads to his resolution. I will set back and go to my father and say to him, and he makes up this speech that he never gets a chance to give. But he makes the resolution. Not only does he feel bad about his sin, not only does he have remorse for his sin, but he's going to resolve to make things right. Now understand, resolution is not the same thing as repentance. No more than making your New Year's resolution makes you automatically lose weight or get in shape or read the Bible, whatever your New Year's resolution is, that's the resolution to make changes. The changes have to come uh, in what follows, which is what happens with the prodigal son. Not only did he resolve to go to his father, he got up and he went to his father. Now, he was going to make this big speech, but he was received the father you know, stifled his speech with a, a hug and wraps him in a robe and throws a big party because his son, which is lost, is now found. Because, you see, there's always a party when a, a sinner repents and because our God is a God who delights in forgiveness. And then finally, there's restitution. At least he... Decided he was, you know, he, he makes the statement, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Make me like one of your sons. He was willing to work off his debt. He was going to, but the father wouldn't allow that. But that's part of what repentance is, to try your best to make what was wrong because of you right again. Okay, so what have we seen so far about Luke and repentance? Well, we've seen that Luke stresses repentance more than all the rest of the New Testament writers, the gospel writers. And so this is something that he's really interested in. And that makes sense because Luke is a, um, uh, he's gone out with Paul uh, and he has preached the gospel. He's heard the gospel preached and he's seen all these people. And so he's interested in repentance. And so he tends to stress stories of Jesus that talk about repentance. And we've seen that um, the uh, idea of repentance is part of Jesus' mission statement. I have come to call sinners to repentance, Luke adds. So, so that is a very 
point of what the gospel is about. And then we've seen these stories where, where Jesus stresses repentance, saying these ancient cities that were pagan and sinful are going to stand up in judgment of his cities because they repented and they, or they would repent and you have not. And then he gives this process of repentance is illustrated in the parable of the lost boy where he realizes his sin, he feels his remorse over it, resolves to change. He goes ahead and reforms and makes those changes and he's willing to make restitution. It's important for us to know all of that because, you see, Satan, the whole time that we're dealing with this process, is trying to get us to slow down. He wants us to refuse to take responsibility and he wants us to rationalize what we've done and, and, and convince ourselves it's really not that big of a deal and that he's going to ridicule the idea that we can even change if we wanted to. You know, the idea that, hey, that's just the way I am. Uh, and that's always the voice of Satan coming to us as he tries to get us to drag our feet rather than change. He gets us to resist, he, the, the, to think that, okay, we'll just put it off a little bit longer. And then the longer we can stay in that sin, the more that we repeat it, the more it becomes part of our makeup. And then we'll completely ignore this call to repent. The question for us as I leave the lesson with you this morning, is are we going to take to heart this call to repentance? There's probably things that every person is struggling with, things that we would never talk about in polite company, things that we wish were different about us, and those are the things that Jesus is calling us to deal with, to do business with this morning. If there's something in your life then don't listen to Satan. Listen to Jesus. He taught us and he showed us by the giving of his own blood that God delights in showing forgiveness. But to do that, he also calls us to repent.